the Praetorian Guard. The personal unit and bodyguard of the Roman emperors. Immortalised in film, remembered for their brutality and seen as the brutal supporters of an ancient dictatorship. The Guard has been immortalised, as we all know, in popular culture in the classic film Gladiator. Now, throughout the film, we see the Guard on numerous occasions, generally like this, confined to the background, limited in their scope and impact of the situation, and generally this is how most of us will ever really think of the Guard. And you can even get this from a general study of the primary sources and the literature, as they are largely quite absent. So, while Gladiator actually gets the common concept of the Guard as background characters and actors right, this placement of the Guard is actually incorrect. The Guard actually, and quite surprisingly, way more important than they are depicted even in the primary sources. And actually, even at times, they are the major players in Imperial politics. As Betty Yu argued, the Praetorian Guard was fundamental to the exercise and retention of imperial power. And it is this concept and the misconception of the guard in general which we will examine and hopefully disprove the misconceptions and reveal the truth by going through a basic history of the Praetorian Guard throughout this video. By looking at the primary sources, modern academic discussion and partially archaeological finds we shall attempt to prove that the Guard was truly the secret power behind the Imperial throne. Now the Guard emerge at the dawn of the Imperial era in 30 BC, and they disappear then with the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in which Constantine wins in 312 AD, which is we will uh, regard as the Praetorian's last stand. And this is the limit of the history we shall try to cover in this video. Now the Praetorians are around for quite a long time, well over three centuries, and this is a vast piece of history to cover, so we shall try and focus on a couple of major sections where the Guard appears a lot in the primary sources. Now this is largely focused around the early Imperial Age, and then another period which begins with the reign of Commodus until around the beginning of the Christ of the third century. And then we shall jump to the final battle of the Milvian Bridge, which you can argue is the last time the guards are in any way obviously relevant, after which, of course, they are disbanded. Now, obviously, why focus on these periods? Well, as I've said, it's where they appear a lot in the primary sources, and that is the major thing here. It's the issue of evidence, particularly in the primary sources, obviously, which means they are overlooked by the general public and historians in general both modern and ancient. And to help us in an analysis of the guard, we shall try to answer four questions. The first being in which, how entrenched were the guard in imperial power and politics? The second, were the guards or the prefecture the true threat? The third, why do you overlook the guard and is it right to do so? And the fourth and final one, can we gather a better concept of the guard, particularly based on their imperial power? Now before we begin, we must try and tackle this issue which will appear probably several times throughout this video, and that is the issue of the guard's disappearance, or lack of appearance for that matter, in the primary sources. Now, as Bingham highlighted, the lack of literary evidence for the guard is probably due to the secret of nature and the fact that they're supposed to be only available to the Emperor. Most references to the Praetorians are incidental, and rarely do any sources attempt to deal with the guard in any detail. And as I said, they're quite a secretive unit. So the fact that they're tied to the Emperor, the fact that they're supposed to be secretive, means that for the average author at the time, there's not likely something you can write about to any sort of substance about them. And for Badeu, this lack of evidence proves that the guard are actually doing their job. They're supposed to be keeping a low profile. This suits the Emperor, right? This suits the Guard, right? And this is what Bedeo saw as the correct way they should be operating. So this theme of them disappearing or not appearing or being quite absent will probably occur several times throughout this video because it does a lot in the history. Now, Suetonius reports where the Guard are actually based. He says that uh, there are three cohorts in Rome itself billeted around the city, 
but that the rest were scattered across Italy and the nearby countryside. Now, Rankov believed that this was Augustus being wary of displaying his military power, which propped himself up. Bedoyer saw this choice to keep these three cohorts in Rome, and only these three cohorts, as an attempt to keep the facade of the Republic ongoing, but also to limit the power and threat of the guard to the Emperor himself. And Augustus is clearly quite wary of the guard, and you can understand why, given how his adoptive father is murdered by those who he sometimes, in some of their cases, trusted most. And as we shall see, he also has another personal bodyguard upon himself to clearly counteract this threat. Now quickly returning to where the guard is posted, we don't actually know where they're based outside of Rome. Augusta near tombstones from guard members can be seen in Aquileia, northeastern Italy, round east of the modern day Venice. However, evidence also supports that several other Italian cities and even regions beyond Italy such as in North Africa and even London. So it's quite clear that the guard could apparently be on state business anywhere at any given time depending on the Emperor's needs. Now let's tackle this issue of the guard in armour. So in most popular depictions in Gladiator and even some reliefs from the period, the guard is portrayed as wearing armour. Now. Rankov actually argues that they're actually not wearing armor at all. He believes they wear togas, at least in the beginning. And this is something to highlight is that there is a bit of a, an argument over whether they wore armor or whether they didn't, but there does appear to be consensus that they weren't necessarily uniform. And that's also something to highlight at this point is that the guard didn't always look the same. So if we go through history in the same way as style and culture and how people dress has changed through British history or French history or any kind of history, it's the exact same in the guard. The guard does not appear the same at the beginning of the period of history as they do at the end of the Battle of Milvian Bridge. So they actually apparently wear toga so much that they get the nickname of Kohor's Togata. So certainly it appears that the guard is wearing togas, but as I said, Academics do tend to argue of where they did or where they didn't. I personally buy into them wearing togas, but you can't really definitively say one way or the other. Now, we do know the guard are involved in certain clandestine actions which we remember them for, so violence, murders and such like that, under the speculatores, which are the special element of the Praetorians which carried that out, particularly at the beginning of their history. Though they also do certain aspects which we uh, overlook, so they do stuff such as uh, map making, firefighting, engineer works, anything that the Emperor requires, and they also have a cavalry element of the guard, which is often overlooked in depictions and is certainly overlooked in our common concept of the guard. Now, Bedoyer highlights that the guard often occupies the space left behind by inadequate or vulnerable rulers. So that is something we have to remember as we go through this history. Often we're looking at the guard being proactive when the emperor is not or when the emperor is vulnerable. So that, I believe, is actually why the Guard is seen as such a violent group, because actually the only times the sources cover them is going to be, as Bedio highlights, when they are being somewhat uh, overstepping their mark and pushing the boundaries of what they're allowed to do. And we're going to see that now as we go through the history. Now, obviously, to begin any history of the Guard, we have to start with the founder, Augustus. So, weirdly enough, we've already covered a lot of what we know about the guard under Augustus because sadly very little is known of them during his reign and he doesn't really mention them in any of his writings. So, as Bingham notes, perhaps this is due to his reluctance to mention and reveal how his power is maintained and actually by the end of the first century AD, the guard has become so entrenched within Roman imperial society that no one really pays attention to the early history. Certainly the primary source of the time, uh, Tacitus, Suetonius, Dio to an extent, overlook them at this period. Though having said that, um, obviously this is very much symbolic of the issues we're going to find. And this theme, as I said, is going to pop up several times. We can get a general vague idea of what they're doing at this time. So, as Bingham notes, 
The very presence of the Praetorian Guard within Rome was one of the few signs that the Imperial Age had really begun. So the Guard are symbolic and very important in that respect. We only can clearly say that is when the Imperial history begins. Really with stuff like the Guards, you don't see that in the Republican era. So they're incredibly important for that reason, I think. Um, as well as Hadrill sort of echoed, the Praetorian Guard is the clearest representation of the military force that maintained imperial law, and the Praetorians were able to remain aggressive to his side given his rank as a military commander, so they very much entrenched the imperial power, particularly under Augustus. And as soon Antonius reports, they certainly get usage of protecting Augustus, as following the defeat of Antony, there are several plots against him. Now, as I've mentioned, briefly before. Augustus isn't that trusting of the guard. He clearly isn't because he has the Germani Corpus Custodes, or the German bodyguards they're colloquially referred to, who are the personal bodyguards of the Julio Claudians. Now, they actually have first seen a unit of this type in the Civil Wars of the Republic because it's found that foreign mercenaries are more likely to be loyal than Romans who could be divided on political lines. So, they also are based outside of Rome, but unlike the Guard, they are owned technically by the Emperor and not the state. So the Praetorians are owned by the Imperial throne as such, whereas the Bodyguard is paid directly by the Emperor and by the Imperial household. So certainly the Bodyguard acts as a counter to the power of the Praetorians, and we need to bear that in mind, especially since, as we'll find out later, when they disappear is when we start to get issues with the Guard overstepping their boundary directly against Imperial powers. But obviously we can discuss a little bit more what happens with the Guard under Augustus. So as Ando states, under Augustus violence appears to become a tool of the state to ensure its continuity. But having said that, if we go to what Suetonius says about the lawlessness and upheaval the state is in at that time, we can understand why Augustus is so careful and so extreme in putting down any kind of threats to himself and arguably to the state at large. Now obviously the guard would have likely been tied into this as the Emperor's personal unit and as a unit which was designed, especially at the beginning, to carry out clandestine operations such as murders, political assassinations and the like. So clearly, Augustus is, is changing the shape of Rome, and, and that is why the guard is able to continue and become so much more direct under the rest of the Julio-Claudians, particularly under Tiberius, for which we are lucky, because actually, Tacitus reports a lot of what goes on under Tiberius. Now, Tacitus immediately, in his description and detailing of the reign of Tiberius sets the tone when he reports that the first thing the new regime does is murder the unarmed and contender to the imperial throne, Posthumus Agrippa. And he actually clearly blames Tiberius for the political murder, of which likely, as we've seen in stuff such as like Claudius, the guard was likely responsible for this as the emperor's personal unit. And this first move of a political assassination completely sets the tone for Tiberius's reign. As far as the guard are concerned, and generally speaking as well, under Tiberius we get threats, violence, and death. So, for the Praetorians, they're actually coming into their element. So you can argue that although Augustus is the founder of the guard, Tiberius cements the guard within the imperial power structure and with imperial life. So Tiberius begins by increasing his military hold over Italy. So he increases the size of garrisons, and he builds the Castra Praetoria, which really changes the guard as it operates, as we shall discuss in a second. And uh, Suetonius reports that he severely represses public dissent, secretly if possible, so once again, likely using the guard. So as we know, Tiberius is clearly way more liberal in using the guard. Uh, Bedayor highlights that they appear to accompany Tiberius in public, such as uh, into the Forum and the Senate, apparently on every occasion. And under him, the guard's powers increase, particularly for the prefects. And it's the first time, I think, you can argue that they pose a true threat. And this actually manifests itself, I'd argue, initially with the construction of the Castra Praetoria. So this is a massive camp in the northeast of Rome, which could house between 4,000 and 12,000 now, as Bingham highlights, this clearly states that the 
people at least have become quite familiar with the presence of the guard. But at the same time, she also argues against the idea of it being a fortress because she said it's not designed to withstand any serious assault, but it's clearly far more fortified than the rest of Rome from where the guard is standing. Um, as after all, as per your highlights, its position means that the guard can be within the city centre within minutes, so this clearly increases the guard's reaction times as well as concentrating them in one location, make them even a more potent threat. Now while the Castra Praetoria represents the symbolic dawn of the guard's true power and might, it's actually more crucial because of the man who builds it, and that is the one and only Sejanus. Now Sejanus is probably the most deadly and dangerous prefect there possibly ever was in the history of the guard. He originally comes from about when he is the sole prefect beginning under Augustus, as he had been a co-prefect with his father until his father had to be removed from the office. And Sejanus actually made himself indispensable to Tiberius, particularly following, apparently, the Senate's refusal to share the burden of administering the Empire. And actually, this is what he does. So Janus actually helps Tiberius administer the Empire. It's the first time that the Praetorian Prefect becomes, effectively, the second man in Rome. And not only is he given power, he's given prominence and respect by Tiberius. His birthday is marked by a festival, and he has statues erected in both his honour and the Emperor's together with inscriptions, and they're even voted to hold consulships together every five years. So, Sejanus is not only the second man in Rome, he is pretty much becoming a co-emperor, if you want to say, with Tiberius. And Dio certainly argues for this. In one quote, he notes that uh, Gallus is, was now paying court to Sejanus, and Dio states it's actually possible that, quote, he believed that Sejanus would become emperor. So, Sejanus is actually so powerful, this Gallus figure, or at least Dio, thinks that he might become Emperor in the relative future. That's how powerful he is getting. And it is this possibility and this claim which is why Sejanus is of such interest to us. Tacitus actually writes that Sejanus actually had eyes on Imperial power and he was planning to murder many members of the Imperial family in order to become Emperor. So, Sejanus seems to know, according to Tacitus, that as long as the Imperial family stand in his way, he can never be Emperor, and he clearly wants to do it, because in Tacitus's account, he actually goes against and kills several members of Tiberius's family, including Tiberius's own son, Drusus, who had become suspicious of Sejanus's power and was the primary obstacle. Now, Sejanus even get so far and so close to becoming uh, at least the heir to the Tiberius, if not Emperor, because Tiberius nearly uh, accepts him marrying into the Imperial family, but um, according to Tacitus, at this point he's becoming aware of Sir James's power and his ambitions and possibly even the murders, even though he sort of has already bought into the idea that Agrippina um, might be trying to depose him, or at least elements in the state are trying to depose him in favour of her. So, um, Tastus, however, at this point, his account seems to disappear, and it is clearly in this period in which Tastus doesn't cover that Sir James falls. But luckily for us, Dio, uh, using archival evidence, has managed to give us an account of what happened, and Tiberius only moves against Sir James, clearly stating his power at this point, due to him being sure now that he is the support of the people and not Sejanus. And Tastus actually argues that Siberius might have even feared Sejanus. Uh, Suetonius certainly believes that um, although he was aware of the power and prestige of Sejanus and kind of prepared himself prior, he was only just about able to bring down the plot. And the way he did this was by uh, electing a new prefect uh, by the name of Macro and sending him into Rome, luring Sejanus out into the open to the Senate, where a letter was read out, which basically stated all the, the things that Sejanus was illegal of, and it got him arrested, murdered, and that was it. That was the end of Sejanus, the most first and most powerful uh, prefect arguably ever. And at this point, it's a good moment 
to highlight that it's normally the Prefect who is the real threat at any given time. Sometimes it's the Guard, but normally it's the Prefect who is the true threat. Uh, uh, the Guard generally would remain neutral unless their own interests were directly threatened. And Sejanus is certainly uh, symbolic of this. And as Suetonius highlights, he's a threat, but the Guard remain neutral and they are actually rewarded for doing so by Tiberius. Now obviously, Sejanus takes up a lot of our coverage of the Guard and Sir Tiberius, but actually he's probably the Prefect we'll cover the most in such detail. We'll probably never cover a Prefect again in this history like this, because he's the first one to do so, and as I said, he's probably the most powerful, the most dangerous one ever. He certainly comes very close to taking the throne, and that's what we need to highlight, is that he is symbolic of the power of the guard because he becomes so close due to his position as well as rewards and extras he's given by Tiberius to becoming emperor and becoming the sole power of the Now we also get a lot of other information uh, under Tiberius for the guard in general. So we know they protect Paiso during his trial as Tastus reports and this suggests um, them being used in higher court hearings at least which means they're sort of tied into the judicial process in general and it's actually under Tiberius that for the first time the Praetorians take to the field under Drusus we sent to Pannonia with two Praetorian cohorts and a large contingent of the Praetorian cavalry to defeat rebels in the region. Now one would likely assume given their preferential treatment the guard would likely make a weak field unit however as the sources argue whenever they do take to the field they appear to generally prove themselves and even be some of the best troops on the field. In fact, as Rankov highlights, the guard actually goes on to see action on numerous occasions, uh, particularly in the late 1st and 2nd centuries, when emperors campaign in person during the period, and the guard, as such therefore, accompanies them on campaign and proves to be elite soldiers both in the social and military sense. But by the end of Tiberius' reign, we see the prefect Macro re-enter the spotlight. Now, Macro apparently is becoming very loyal to Caligula, Tiberius' heir, and this is of quite true importance because allegedly Macro has Tiberius smothered in his frail and final days. And not only does he report this, but Suetonius and Dio support the theory, and Suetonius clearly claims that Caligula is ordering this, and I certainly support that theory. Uh, only Seneca and Philo actually argue against this idea of Tiberius being murdered. They claim he died naturally, but with this moment, it's the first time that the guard actually affects the imperial succession. They all go on to do it several times throughout their history. Now from day one, the Praetorians are clearly tied into the reign of Caligula and the powers obviously get to that extent. So, Dyer reports that Caligula has Macro go to the Senate and declare that the will Tiberius created, which left the state to Tiberius' grandson, was void due to Tiberius' insanity. So not only are they tied into his succession by ensuring that a will is made void, they may have also killed his predecessor, and they are certainly involved with the atrocities and acts of madness which he commits during his reign. It makes a lot of sense for an emperor to use their personal bodyguard, their personal unit, the unit which answers only to them to commit acts which um, they order directly or which are largely illegal and certainly Caligula meets those criteria. As we know, he's a renowned madman. He has people killed arbitrarily and murders anyone who even slightly displeases them or looks in a funny way. And the sources generally report horrible, horrible things. So Dyer reports how he forces Macro, the man who helped him get into power, to commit suicide along with his wife as there had been an accusation of them about to lead a coup against him and obviously there was no way of going back from this and they just killed themselves to avoid extreme punishment and horrible, horrible death. In fact, all our sources report Caligula committing several atrocities and crimes and the Praetorians were likely involved in this. Josephus reports that the Tribune Chirea, who shall become important very soon, was forced to torture a woman. So clearly they perform disgusting and violent acts for the Emperor. And we don't really know uh, how they would have felt like this. Josephus claims that Chirea sort of becomes guilty and he doesn't want to do them. 
although he's the only one to put this moralistic aspect to Kyria and to the garden. One could question his kind of purpose in that. But one of the things that clearly must have turned the guard against him was the numerous stunts, events, and embarrassments he flicks upon them when he involves them in his own mad ravings. In fact, there are several instances in which the Praetorians are forced to take to pack animals in order to keep up with Caligula's mad jaunts and journeys off away from the column while on campaign, and there are instances in which he ordered his retinue and the Praetorian cavalry who were his bodyguards to accompany him across the Rhine, where he orders them to cut down trees and bring them back as war trophies. And these grand political slash military stunts go on throughout his reign. There's an instant in which he has his soldiers collect seashells as a sign of tribute from Neptune. And then another instant in which he marches them across a bridge of ships in a bay in full regalia, acting as if it was some great conquest again. Although Dio makes no explicit reference to Praetorians uh, in this instance of the bridge, Suetonius reports the entire guard is involved. And this aspect of insults certainly is Kyrea, who leads the conspiracy against Caligula to act as he is allegedly uh, called effeminate by Caligula on several occasions, and all the sources back this up. Although, as Bingham highlights, the conspiracy is largely centered around officers of the guard and not the guard in general. Like I said earlier, the guard generally remains neutral. So certainly, the conspirators bide their time and wait until one day they get able to separate Caligula from the rest of his guards as he leaves the theatre and they attack him and stab him several times. In fact, Dio reports they have such fury and anger at Caligula himself that some of them eat parts of his corpse in the fury. Now, Suetonius reports a version in which Caligula's wife is murdered at the same time and his daughter is dashed against the wall. However, Josephus has a differing version where the wife and child are killed later under Kyrae's orders. We do know that Caligula is killed this time, and we certainly know that his wife and daughter died within a few hours of him. And as we've noted before, most of the Praetorians aren't in the plot. In fact, the cohort on guard with Caligula fans out trying to find out who performed this murder. They're not aware of what's going on. And actually, the German bodyguards go on the rampage. So, this is a complete upheaval in Rome. Roman history will never be the same due to the guards after this. And as Bingham notes, this is immensely significant. This is the first time that the guards have taken an overtly political action. And this proved they could directly affect the political scene of Rome. And that from now on, the emperors had to directly watch the guard. But with the murder of Caligula, it's not just the first time the guard directly end the reign of an emperor, it's the first time they begin the reign of another, Claudius. Torians are actually looting the palace for any goods they can find when they discover Claudius under a curtain. So while Claudius is therefore begging for his life, believing he is about to be murdered, the guard realise that here is an emperor who can continue and justify their own existence now they don't have an emperor, and here is one they can control. Therefore, they escort him back to the camp, where he buys the loyalties of the soldiers. According to Suetonius, he's the first of the Caesars to have won the loyalty of his soldiers with bribery, because he allegedly gives a donative work about five years of pay to even a Praetorian. And after this, the Senate just bow down. And this is clearly symbolic and shows the true power of the Praetorians. They selected the candidate, they take him back to the camp, and from there on, all of Rome submits to their choice, and essentially to them. And after this, there is a general consensus that Kyrea and the conspirators go from being some of the leading figures in Rome and heroes to being executed by Claudius. Um, but only Josephus clearly states that Kyrea directly threatened Claudius' life, though Suetonius supports this notion. But clearly they are all executed, um, and Claudius secures his position in doing so. And as Bingham highlights, even though these figures are now leading figures in the Guard, the Guard is content with their regime change, and therefore doesn't intervene to save them. And as Gibson highlights, that means that now the Praetorians are purely responsible for the accession of Claudius. Now, the Guard 
aren't reported quite in so much detail as they are in the first few days of Claudius's reign, or at least Caligula's death. But they certainly are marked quite heavily by Claudius and in that way respected by him as we see them in his first coinage where it depicts the emperor and the guard on the coin. That's incredibly important. This shows how connected they are to imperial power. Although this disappears within a few years entirely, so we don't quite know why this might be. So either he no longer needs to have their support or by now he has it anyway, as Gibson argued. And as Bingham highlighted, clearly, uh, at least in his early years, he is keen to ensure the support of the Praetorians, and you can understand why, given how he got there. And as Dyer reports, he's not just careful to keep them loyal, he's careful to keep them close to him at all times. They accompany him to even parties and places where it should be safe, anywhere he goes for that matter. So, as we know, although the Emperors are subject to attacks and subject to threats, as Claudius himself was, they are now becoming closer and closer to the Emperor himself. And certainly, we know that Claudius's wife, Messalina, was executed by Praetorians under orders from their Prefect. They are now directly and officially executing members of the Imperial family openly. And that actually was done, to an extent, without Claudius's full consent or knowledge. So even though the guard is loyal, you can see to an extent, once again, they're sort of taking power into their own hands. Um, but having said that, they also clearly aren't that effective as, according to Suetonius and Josephus, they fail to protect Claudius from Agrippina, his next wife, who actually poisons him. Claudius actually succumbs to the poison and dies, but given Tacitus's comments about the guards shutting off access to the scene of the murder with orders to say that the Emperor's health is improving. The Praetorians appear complicit in the murder of Claudius by Agrippina and one can question whether they were because certainly it was not below them to do so and they would do so later on again. This becomes even more suspicious given that the Prefect Burrus had been elevated in 51 AD as one of Agrippina's creatures. She claimed there was a need for discipline in the ranks, despite there being no obvious need at that time, so one could question whether she was already preparing for the succession of his son to Claudius and the elimination of Britannicus. And this is even more amplified, given that the sight of Nero leaving the palace with Burrus implies that he had already secured the Praetorians prior to Claudius's death to ensure his own succession. In fact, the fact that he makes his first move by going with the Praetorians highlights their power and their importance in connection to the Imperial throne. In fact, he meets the guard and has them proclaim him Emperor first, and only following this does he go to the Senate, the official government, and ask their permission. And actually, the Praetorians are revealed to be powerful even within Nero's own reign when there is a dispute between himself and his mother Agrippina. As Bingham reports, this dispute about a year in, Agrippina actually threatens to present Britannicus in the Castra Praetoria, in the Praetorian camp, as Claudius's true heir. Now, the fact that she relies and puts emphasis on the guard and their support for an heir shows how important and how crucial and how fundamental, I believe, the guard are at this point to the Emperor and to Imperial power. And clearly, this suggests that the Imperial family is somewhat reliant on the guards to shore up or even remove Imperial power from any one individual. But as we know, Nero proves to be just as much of a madman as Caligula. Though that he is known to wander the streets with both, and I quote, soldiers and gladiators, according to Tacitus, and assault individuals at random. And those who resisted too much were actually killed. So these soldiers are likely Praetorians. Burrus and a lot of the officers get caught up in several conspiracies, allegedly, and they all end up dead. But one thing we must note is that the soldiers, which are likely once again the Praetorians, are supposedly raiding homes following the revelations of these conspiracies 
and looking for conspirators, at least the Pisonian conspirators and like the others, and they actually man the walls and effectively place the city on lockdown. But once again, we see that they are tied into the use of violence, the threat of violence, and somewhat clandestine and judicial processes. Therefore, they are incredibly important to Nero. In fact, he uses them to ensure kind of the support of the Senate when they are nearby, when the Senate are called to hear a speech from the Emperor's Quaestor. In fact, they had actually taken over a temple nearby and were present within the Senate House itself, which was somewhat illegal at the time, even then. But as we know, Nero was incredibly unpopular, rebellions broke out, and actually the entire guard rank, file, and officer abandoned him when they were led by their prefect Sabinus out of the way to join the rebels. And apparently, according to Bingham, Nero was planning to continue on and fight against these rebellions until it became clear that his guard had abandoned him, and as we know, he later goes on to commit suicide. Now, we can see a different shift in the way the guard operate with the new emperor Galba, whom they had gone over to when they betrayed Nero. See, Galba had supposedly promised Vice Sabinus a large donative. However, he went back on his word and said that he was not going to give them the donative as he refused to, quote, bribe his soldiers and to buy their loyalty. This, along with other measures, made him extremely unpopular with the military, particularly the guard. In fact, Sabinus felt the new emperor was beginning to undermine his position and he actually attempted to have the guard portray Galba and proclaim himself emperor though surprisingly the guards refuse and murder him the Castrofatoria around this time. Although Tacitus reports that after this, the guard was quote, ripe for revolution. Now, the 14 years under Nero had led to a guard which was ill-disciplined and hostile to anyone who attempts to put authority on them like Galba was now doing. In fact, Galba clearly was aware of this, and he attempted to consolidate his position and pacify the guard by declaring his heir, one Piso, in the Castro Praetoria. Now this shows his awareness of what Bingham states was that any ruler needed the support of their Praetorians. However, as we go on to find out, Suetonius claims that Galba's failure to provide the donative at this instance with the proclamation of his heir led to the guard going over to Otho who we shall now mention, as Otho is actually a figure of much interest when we look at the guard's history. Otho was an officer who would actually hope to be declared Galba's heir. However, as we know, Galba chose Piso, and upon this snub, he clearly launches into a full-blown campaign to win the guard over, once again, highlighting their importance and powers to his side in order to become emperor. Otho was quite clever, he did this takeover quite clandestine and very secretively. He had certain members of the Praetorians who he'd already bought go out and buy their comrades and their colleagues' loyalties. And in fact, on the day he made his move, he was initially horrified to find that only a small number of these men had actually gone over to him and met him at the meeting place. Although, following this on the move to the Praetoria, the Castro Praetoria, a lot more of the Praetorians join him. In fact, when they get there, the crowd is clearly so large that the guard and the camp in general is surrendered to Otho by the officers who oppose him. Though Tacitus claims not all were part of this coup, it's clear that the officers were quite concerned about how far it spread through the ranks, and clearly this sentiment had been building for quite some time. And in fact, even though Otho had clearly won over most of the Praetorians, he was particularly careful not to attack any Praetorians directly. Therefore, he did not attack those who were either A, loyal to Galba, or B, those who were on guard with Galba at that present time. In fact, the cohort which had been on guard with Galba at the time of the conspiracy had also been the one which had abandoned Nero and murdered Caligula. And therefore, according to Suetonius, Otho did not wish to insult them further. The Praetorians proclaimed Otho Emperor and armed themselves in order to take on Galba. In fact, it's reported they acted with their officers, and this shows a rare occasion that the guard act seemingly unanimously against an emperor. In fact, Galba appears to panic at this point and sends emissaries to the camp to regain control, but hears false reports of Otho's murder and death at the hands of the guards, and when he came out of the open at the capital, he actually brought about his own doom. 
as the Praetorians charged the area. The crowds around Galba fled and abandoned him, and he was murdered there along with his heir Piso. And certainly, as Morrison highlighted, his foolish choice to abolish the German bodyguard who had been active under the Judo Claudians actually, in this instance, had they been there, might have saved him. So it proved to be his own undoing. Although, having said that, once again, not all the guard went over to Otho. Some of them actually resisted the Praetorians and fought against their colleagues, including this notorious, probably semi-mythical last stand of Sopronius Densus, who supposedly defended Galba against the mob and allowed time for the designated Paiso to escape, although, as we know, he is later killed by at least one Praetorian himself. So now, once again, the Praetorians have chosen their own leader. They have chosen Otho after they felt they had been unfairly treated by Galba, who had tried posing order on them. And once again, he has gone to the Praetorians first. Emperors are consistently doing this. They're going to the Praetorians long before the people, long before the Senate, ensuring their support as the primary basis for their proclamation. In fact, Morrison highlighted that the support of Otho by the guard showed the Praetorians' ability to act as independent kingmakers, as they had solely been responsible for putting Otho on the throne. There had been zero support, supposedly, prior to this instance. And the guard clearly enjoyed their life under Otho. As Tastus reports, allegedly, the will of the soldiers was henceforth supreme. So. Apparently, they also get to choose their own prefect now. They're in total control of themselves and of their own actions. Although it is quite likely that this is purely dramatic effect and that Otho is in actually in more control than Tastus reports. Morrison also notes the unrestrained actions of the Praetorians during Otho's short reign. Clearly, they are uh, an independent and somewhat dangerous force in this period and he actually has clearly won them over. There was an instance in which there was an instant of confusion at the Castra Praetoria. The guard actually assumed that there was a coup being launched against the Emperor, and they ran riot. They killed any officer who tried to limit them, or tried to get them to calm down, and stormed the palace demanding to see the Emperor. Luckily, everything managed to calm down, as order was restored and Arthur came forth, but that showed the kind of loyalty he enjoyed from his troops. But now we're going to jump forward a little bit because there's not much for us really to look at here that is of interest to us. Uh, there is stuff that happens obviously under Otho and a little bit under Vespasian, but for our history at least, we're going to jump now to when the guard resurfaces after a long period of absence in the histories due to good rulers, and they resurface under a bad one, a particularly bad one, by the name of Commodus. Now, as already mentioned, Commodus was a weak ruler. But uh, the Prefect of the Guard actually is able to consolidate under himself a lot of power as allegedly Commodus is quite reluctant and lazy to actually take over the rule of the Empire. But uh, this Perennis, this Prefect, actually tries to uh, take over after amassing so much wealth and power. Allegedly, he was, according to Herodian, the wealthiest man of his day. And as already stated, he did have designs on Imperial power. So even though he tries to make those moves, eventually he is found out and the only moment he becomes aware of this is actually when Commodus' uh, men arrive at the door and execute him. But clearly as a result, Commodus is quite distrustful of the garden as prefect and he elevates his trusted friend Cleander to high office who is essentially de facto head of the guard as a result. Dio describes Cleander as a corrupt and violent officer and this certainly seems to be the case. Rankov summarizes the period best when he states that Commodus and his friends actually plunge Rome and the Garden itself into chaos, and the prefects are hired and fired on the daily by Cleander, and there are several atrocities committed by the friends. However, Commodus eventually grew so paranoid and mad that he even put on a list the names of his mistress and prefect of his Praetorians, and these were to be killed. However, they were discovered by the mistress, who informed the prefect, and he led a coup and a conspiracy against Commodus, which eventually resulted in Commodus being strangled. Now, after the death of Commodus, one Pertinax, whom Herodian thinks isn't involved in the plots but is elected due to his personal straits, but 
Dio believes actually orchestrated the whole thing by going to the Praetorians first is popularly uh, supported and elected essentially emperor by the guard, by the people, by everyone involved. And he's incredibly popular with most groups, as Herodian reports. But sadly, he's not liked by the guard. In fact, it appears that uh, he tries to reimpose authority on the guard, and that completely angers them. They don't like they've had so much unlimited power prior, and now they're being having to show restraint. So the guard are, quote, prohibited from seizures and damages to property, and that's Pertinax had effectively ensured, quote, an end to their own unlimited power. And I agree with what uh, Chemesis says when he puts this down and Pusnax's underestimation of the guard in general as the cause of his own downfall. Uh, this is certainly true because in a few short months the guard becomes so angry they storm the palace and kill the emperor. And they know this is a very unpopular move, they know this was selfish and wrong of them to do so because they retreat back to the Praetorian camp to avoid the anger of the population according to Herodian. So once again, we can see here the guards are taking their own hands, political change, and the politics of Rome. And following this, we do see the guard act quite independent and take imperial succession into their own hands on several occasions. And actually, when they realize that they are the only authority in Rome, no one has stopped them and no one has acted against them following the death of Pertinax, apparently they proclaim from the walls they are going to auction off the Empire to the highest bidder, and this is unprecedented. This is a complete and utter step beyond for the Guard. No one's ever expected them to do something like this, and certainly this shows they are independent kingmakers. Now, the man who wins this auction is one Didius Julianus, who wins this by promising large amounts of money and a return to these unchecked powers the Guard have previously had. Now, there is a uh, clear absence of the people, so clearly they're even afraid of the guard at this point. The general populace, even though they outnumber the guard, are afraid of them. But Julianus actually can't afford to pay the guard like he promises, and that sort of begins their own downfall. That and the arrival of Septimius Severus's army, who actually manages to infiltrate the city with a small number of troops, and the government begins to panic and the Praetorians and the Senate abandon him and allegedly the Senate send over uh, quote a military tribune and they execute Julianus. So this could have been a Praetorian or this might have been a regular soldier. But clearly the guard had lost control here and that actually is symbolic of what's going to happen under Severus initially. The guard do actually lose control. Now Severus is a shrewd general and a stern man. He actually lures the Praetorians out with promises of clemency and surrounds them and has them arrested and executes the murders of Pertinax. So now the guard is surrounded. They've lost their leadership who was involved in the murder of Pertinax and he actually wants nothing to do with this uh, rogue guard, this guard who'd been renowned for causing violence and political assassinations and uh, you know, deposed emperors. So he hasn't disbanded. And as Southerns have described, the Praetorians had become an arrogant body of men, terrorizing people and abusing their privileges. So we can certainly see why Severus disbands the guard. It's totally understandable. And actually, what he does is he gets a new and loyal guard by making them uh, come out of his own troops. And so they originate in the legions, and he tries to make them loyal to him, but this actually fails, as we'll see, and actually they continue to be kingmakers, interfere. In fact, Severus even changes how the guard is stationed. He has most of them removed from the city and based over 100 miles away, and he has a legion brought in to be based at Albinum near Rome, so it's nearby, to counter the guard's own powers. So we have seen a change in how the guard is operating, how the guard is formed, but even then, as Betio highlights, Severus has tried for and hoped for a new guard, a new loyal guard, but even following these reforms, the guard continued to make and break emperors, even within Severus's own dynasty. Now, following the death of Severus, it is his two sons, Caracalla and Gita, who co-rule, though this doesn't last long as the brothers cannot stand each other. In fact, Caracalla personally murders his brother and then flees to the Castor Praetoria, claiming there was an attempt on his life and he bribes the Praetorians, who are clearly, according to Rodian, quite aware of what actually has happened. And he clearly must have used them to purge his brother's supporters. 
and he uses them in two bloodbaths. First against the people of Rome when they begin to insult Caracalla's favourite charioteer and they kill everyone within reach or at least sparing those who bribe them or who they mug as they try to kill them. And the second and arguably even worse one you can say is after Alexandria insults Caracalla he orders that the youths are to be collected together in a place where he has them surrounded by Praetorians and they are butchered. Absolute massacre. And then we see the rise of another prefect, this time one Macrinus, who is constantly insulted by Caracalla. And even though this is going on, even though he clearly must not have liked Caracalla, he is forced to by him, in a naive way, to attend to the letters that Caracalla refuses to deal with. And Macrinus reads that people are advising that he himself, so Macrinus, be murdered due to his own power. So he acts first, Macrinus. He gets a centurion who, like himself, has been wronged by Caracalla. And then they wait until Caracalla suffers with stomach problems and has to go to side to re relieve himself. And the centurion strikes, stabs Caracalla, killing him with one blow, before he himself is cut down by the Germanic cavalry. And Macrinus is able to turn this to his own advantage and get himself proclaimed emperor. Though we won't really look at this directly as it's not actually him who's of interest to us, but the man who defeats him in battle. Now this Elagabalus who defeats Macrinus turns out to be a very unpopular emperor. He actually makes a mockery of Rome's religion on several occasions and he's considered quite feminine and the guards and the military in general turn against him in favour of his cousin Alexander and even Elagabalus can see how clearly this is going on and Bingham believes that Elagabalus certainly must have tried to have Alexander murdered in his own final months of rule and all this comes to a head when Elagabalus attempts to test the guard by claiming Alexander is dying and refusing to let them to go see him so they actually refuse to guard the emperor and go back to the Praetorian camp claiming they will not leave until Alexander comes to them. So Elagabalus panics, brings himself and Alexander to the camp, and is then infuriated when he sees the guard ignore him in favour of Alexander, and he begins crying out for the punishment of those who are ignoring him, and the guard are now totally tired of him and his antics, and they just kill him and his entire retinue within the Castropraetoria. So Elagabalus is one of another one of those emperors who has lost the guard entirely. Now, Alexander comes to the throne, obviously very popular with the guard, but at the same time, he is actually one of the worst emperors for the guard, not because they don't like him, they love the boy. They have unchecked powers under him, and they are actually able to run amok in Rome. So certainly, they are actually reported to them getting into violent riots after they burn down some buildings and the population rises against them. In fact, Dyer reports that even when he was consul, he was advised not to go to Rome due to the guard not liking him. And Dyer clearly is, is terrified, even though he tries to hide it, of the guard. He has every right to be, given how they've behaved. Um, the guard actually go on to murder their own prefect directly in front of the emperor. So let's not overlook this. This emperor is likely still a boy in his teens, and they kill a man directly in front of him who is supposed to be their leader and the emperor's chosen officer for the guard. Now, following the murder of Alexander during a mutiny, there begins the crisis of the third century. And as historians have already noted prior in this video, when no one is able to impose authority on the guard, which no one really does during this period, due to, as I said, it's a crisis. No one is able to establish a steady government for quite some time. The guard run amok. They fill in the void. They fill in the gaps left by weak leadership, and they do as they please. But even then, it's not a good time for the guard either. It's a good time for no one in Rome. So the new emperor is one Maximus Thrax, who is incredibly unpopular and actually is murdered with the assistance of the guards, the guard helped murder him after a long siege at Aquileia, which seems almost spontaneous. They spontaneously all mutiny and murder him. But then at around the same time, the skeleton force of Praetorians that remain in Rome are surrounded and attacked by the civilian population who are encouraged by senators to make Praetorians pay for their past misdeeds. Now this 
further escalates and actually there is an instant where there is much confusion and no one's quite certain what goes on but something spurs the Praetorians left in the city to go into revolt and start attacking everyone. In fact, there's a massive riot and the guard is forced back to the Castro Praetoria by the citizens and they began to besiege it. So the Praetorians are now besieged within their own camp by the general population. This has never happened before. The guards have officially lost total control. No one's running anything at the moment. Everyone's out for themselves. But then after a while, the guards sally out and begin to attack the civilians once more, who flee to the rooftops and begin pelting them with anything they get their hands on. So the guard respond by setting the buildings on fire. Now this caused such a large fire that massive parts of the city were burnt. Many were killed or made poor. Herodian actually claims that this huge section of the city, which was absolutely ruined and razed to the ground, was bigger than any other city in its own size. So allegedly, the Praetorians had now burnt down an entire city-sized area of Rome. The Senate then elects its own two emperors to likely bring back order and discipline and to end these riots across the city, but given that at this point the guard was such an undisciplined rabble because no one had tried to exert authority and order on them, that they begin to fear that they'll be replaced by Germanic bodyguard. These emperors have their own German bodyguard with them and the Praetorians think that obviously these men will go on to replace them. So given that and given they're actually supporting another claimant, one Gordian III, they waited till the population were away at the games and stormed the palace, capture these two emperors, torture them and drag them back to the Praetorian camp. And even though the Germanic bodyguard responds and reaches the Castro Praetoria very soon, the emperors have already been torched and then they are executed before the Germans can break in. And the guard then take this Gordian III, proclaim him and seal themselves away within the camp. And with the proclamation of this new emperor, with the sealing of the doors of the camp, it kind of ends what we really know about the guard. As Rankov notes, after about 2388, the sources for the guard begin to dry up. Though we do know they murder the Emperor Philip's son in 249 in the Castro Praetoria itself. But we find very little for the guard in general following the instance. So the next big thing we know the Praetorians do is proclaim a Maxentius Emperor several decades later. And one can argue that this is actually the worst decision ever. In fact, they clearly backed the wrong horse because at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, facing Constantine, they surround the Emperor and fight loyally to the last man, trying to hold the bridge, trying to protect Rome, trying to protect their Emperor, but the pontoon bridge upon which they stand collapses and many on board, including the Emperor Maxentius himself, are swept into the river and drowned. Now, the remnants of the guard come before Constantine, where he orders that the guard be disbanded and he demolishes the wall separating the Castropratoria and the city. And surprisingly, with the end of that wall, comes the end of the guard. The Praetorian Guard existed for around 350 years and were clearly a key element of the Imperial period. We have seen them slaughter emperors, nobles and civilians alike. We have seen them shake the empire and break the empire in a moment's notice. Now, if we return to roughly where we began with this popular depiction of the Guard in the film Gladiator, we can see the accuracies and the misconceptions represented in the guard in the film. So we can then see how the guard is misunderstood and now we know why they're misunderstood and I think we can answer the four questions we set ourselves at the beginning of this video. So, as we ask for our first question, how entrenched were the guards in imperial power and politics? Well, clearly as we have seen, the guard was certainly a power to be reckoned with and at times they are the only authority and power within Rome. There are instances in which they can force through the succession of any emperor they wish. The Senate bows to them, the people bow to them, and they take over effectively at parts. Clearly they're part of the imperial power system, and we cannot afford to overlook that. Numerous emperors owe their position to the guard, and 
you cannot fully understand and appreciate imperial power and politics without a grasp of the guard and its basic powers and acts, as several historians, as we have seen, have argued throughout this piece. And for our second question as to who was the greater threat, the prefect or the guard, well, as we have seen, when it comes to general plotting, the prefects are clearly the true threat. No one really argues that the whole guard was in with many conspiracies, that they're involved. It's generally just its officers, notably the prefecture. And the prefect is also an incredibly powerful figure, at times, as we have seen, second only to the emperor. They've always been a powerful figure. So, clearly, they are a threat directly to the emperor at all times. But then, having said that, as we have seen, when an emperor begins to affect the guard directly, when he begins to take away and displease the general guard by threatening its interests, they can rise up, they can almost unanimously become a riotous and dissident sect of the government, and they are almost unstoppable given how volatile they can be in these moments. So when it comes to this question, you can have effectively a balance of both. They're both dangerous in their own ways. The prefects are always dangerous, and a poor choice in prefects can get you killed. But then the guard can be just as even more dangerous if you displease them and directly affect their interests. Now for our third question about the, how we overlook the guard and questioning is it right to do so, well as we have seen, the guards are overlooked largely because they're overlooked by the contemporaries, by the prime historians, and since they do that, of course everyone else in history generally does it, and that is why we view them in such a minor and limited way. But clearly we should not overlook the guard, and there has been a lack of discussion about them, except until recent years when we've seen the rise of more studies and more books upon them. But clearly we need to look into them further and have a more nuanced view of the guard, as we have clearly seen, they cannot be overlooked. They are so much part of the imperial system, the fact they've been overlooked is almost comical, and clearly there needs to be a new academic interest in the subject. Now, as we have already shown in a way, we can already answer question four, which is, can we get a better concept of the guard? Can we grasp a better concept of the guard, particularly based on their imperial power? Well, we've been arguing for that this entire video, and I believe, yes, we can get a better grasp of the guard than what we know in popular culture, beliefs, and in general knowledge. We know they are not some murderous background group, although, of course, as we've also seen, they are largely occupied with death, destruction, and mayhem. But they, we also know they are often major political players in Rome and have shaped it in almost unforeseen ways. No one expected them to be able to shake the empire and make the empire and shape it in their own way at any given notice like they have. They clearly go way beyond the original mandate and we need to further explore that. Sadly, the lack of primary sources will always limit us to what we can know. But I think if we do have a look at the guard, if we do spend time analysing them, looking for more archaeological evidence, we can stop overlooking them and appreciate their own power. And to conclude on what we have argued for this entire video, it's clearly quite simple. The guard is evidently an overlooked group, but one that is truly one of the secret powers behind the Emperors and the Imperial Throne.